Hi guys, and welcome to a Hector Lecture Guide to the Fight Containment Bay P1T6. This is Sophia. As this guide is releasing before patch 6.3, be aware that this is currently based off of the minimum eye level no echo version of Sophia Extreme currently in the game, with the assumption that both DPS checks and heal checks are going to be upped by the time it's released as Unreal. Things to prepare in advance of this fight. You're going to need to have partners. This is one tank healer with one DPS. I recommend partnering tanks with melees, healers with range. You can have pre-assigned positions around the boss like you see here with whichever tank has aggro being in front and whichever tank doesn't behind. Or you can do what a lot of groups do, which is just mark each of your tanks and healers with a different colored symbol and have your DPS adjust to find them whenever the time comes. The only mechanic this will ever be required for is one called Sin and Punishment, where players are targeted with light and dark circles. All tanks and healers get one color, all DPS get the other color, and you just need to make sure that you have one of each stood next to each other. It doesn't matter where you are, as long as you're not stacked too near to any other pair. If you are not paired when this goes off, then you're going to get either a spicy bleed or a debuff that makes it so you can't be healed as easily, and you're likely to die to raid-wide damage afterwards. More importantly, never stack two of the same color, as it will explode giving everyone that debuff. As long as you've got one of each color, you're stacked in your partners, Sin and Punishment gets resolved really easily. There's a tank buster in this fight, Arms of Wisdom. It does not have a cast bar, instead it has a visual telegraph. When you see the boss start to be surrounded by green and blue waves, prepare for a tank buster. This tank buster does not cleave, however it does hit quite heavily. I recommend using one long cooldown and one short cooldown for each of these tank busters for how frequently they hit. Be aware this also comes with a knockback. I recommend positioning directly under the chin of the daughter or the head that you see, and that way when you get hit by the knockback, it's only going to push you out to about the edge of the hitbox. Finally, if the tank hit by this takes damage from the attack, they're going to get themselves a thunder resistance down, meaning that they're going to take uh, lethal damage from the next autos, so make sure that you have a tank swap during this. You can just have your two tanks stack on top of each other for this, as again, it does not cleave. The only raid-wide to worry about throughout the fight is Chintamani. You're going to see the boss glow yellow, and you're going to see sort of a thundery effect around the boss. After a short while, this is going to go off, and you're going to get hit by either two or three raid-wide hits, depending on how far you are into the fight. I recommend both shielding and mitigating these, as they hit quite hard. There's also two untelegraphed AoEs you need to look out for. Here you're going to be looking at the cast bar instead of the animation. If you see Thunder 2 cast, Get, don't be in front of the boss, as it's going to be a conal AoE in front. If you see Thunder 3 being cast, get inside the hitbox, as it's a donut that aligns more or less perfectly with the boss's hitbox. The fight will always start with Thunder 2 targeting the main tank, so make sure that you move out of the way. Next up, the head is going to disappear from underneath the boss and teleport to a random intercardinal. You can either move right next to it, ready to ride a very large knockback, or just pop knockback immunity, which I recommend the main tank does, as you will not need it for the next two minutes, and it helps to keep the boss from moving. You're then going to get your first tank buster of the fight, so make sure to both mitigate this and perform the tank swap, and watch out for the knockback. And then four clones are going to appear. There are two possible arrangements and mechanic combos for these clones. Here's the first one. You can spot this immediately because the clones appear on intercardinals and they diagonally face inwards. This will always be partnered with two of the clones at the end doing a donut and two of them doing a point blank AoE. The donuts will always be diagonally opposite each other, so there's only two possible safe spot combinations here. For this one, start in the hitbox as the boss will start by casting Thunder 3 and Tether 2 adds. This is just loading the mechanic up into the clone. The boss is the one casting it, so the donut is still from the boss. Remember those two clones, because they're the safe spot for the end of this. Afterwards, the boss casts arrow 3, and you see a telegraph for an AoE. Get away from the boss, because this both hits hard and does a knockback that will likely knock you off the edge of the arena. Finally, the boss will cast execute, and all of the clones are going to use whatever they had uh, the boss used when they were tethered. In this case, as long as you're stood on one that was tethered during the Thunder 3 cast, you're perfectly fine. The other clone combination is a little bit trickier, as there are six different possible locations where the four clones can appear. Here's all six of them with the directions they will face. The clones that appear in the corners this time are going to face due east-west, and the clones that appear north-south are always going to be facing directly towards the middle. You're only going to get four of these clones. 
and this time one of them is going to perform the Cone Thunder 2, while the other three are doing that point blank arrow AoE. Now, you can, as just a safe spot always, go behind whichever clone is tethered with the Thunder 2, but you don't actually have to pay attention to this. If any of the corners are free, you can always just go to that corner, and that corner will always be safe. So, for instance, I'm going to keep the D corner free from a clone for all of these combinations you'll see here, and no matter where the cleave is, no matter where the other clones are, it does not matter. As long as there's not a clone in D, you can just go to D and you're safe. This works with any of the corners as long as there's not a clone in that corner. There's one combination that doesn't work this way. That's if you happen to get this combo where it's all four of the clones are in the corner, but it's the Thunder 2 combo. You can tell this because they're not diagonally facing inwards, they're facing east-west. In this case, you do need to pay attention to where the Thunder 2 is. You can either go to the missing clone spot that's not getting cleaved, or you can just go behind that clone. Lots of safe space. That's the only one to work out for. Again, you're going to get four clones. They appear in a random spot. The boss is going to tether one of them because cast Thunder 2. So get behind the boss so you don't get hit by this. And afterwards, you can dodge the arrow 3 by just heading towards any of the free corners. Boss cast Execute. And as long as you're not stood in the way of where any of those AoEs are going to be, you're perfectly fine. This is followed by one more Arms of Wisdom tank buster. And then the boss is going to disappear, become briefly untargetable, and start moving towards the north, as that's where the boss will reappear. You have about two GCDs to attack the boss before it finishes its cast of Cloudy Heavens. A couple things happen. First, everybody gets a debuff. This debuff is going to essentially serve as the Enrage timer for Ad Phase. If you your timer reaches zero on this debuff, or if at any point in time you reach zero HP, you immediately get the zombification debuff instead, and you don't have control of your character. You aimlessly wander around attacking teammates. The only way to cleanse this is to kill all of the ads. The other things that happen are that the stage transitions, and the boss puts a shield around themselves so that you cannot damage them anymore. Finally, three ads appear. Let's break down what each of these does, and I'm going to break them down in the order that we're going to target these ads during the phase. The first one we're always going to attack is the second Demiurge. We do this because, in addition to its one spell, Divine Spark, the second Demiurge also acts as a healer for the other two adds, so it makes it a lot trickier if you leave this one to last. Divine Spark is its only cast, and it's a standard gaze. Look away when the cast goes off. If not, you're going to get a confused debuff. The third Demiurge has a couple of different moves. First, Gnostic Spear is just a line AoE that's telegraphed that targets a random player if you see this step out of it. At a set point in time, the third is also going to cast Ring of Pain. This is again telegraphed, so dodge the attack, but when it goes off, it leaves a persistent ice puddle that stays on the stage, and if you ever walk through it, you get a pretty spicy damage over time. So don't walk through it. Finally, we tend to have the third Demiurge after this pulled to the corner because at 60% health, it's going to cast Gnostic Rant. This is a 270 degree cleave. If you have it both pulled to the corner and facing the corner, everyone else in the party will naturally dodge this. The only person has to work out is the tank who's taking it so that they can move through the boss before the end of the cast. Finally, first Demiurge also has a few sp skills. Vertical Kenoma is going to put a Pari shield both in front and behind the boss. You can attack it safely from the side during this, but if you attack it from the front or the back, you're both going to get a Volan stack, take damage, and get knocked back. This is a big enough knockback that it can very easily knock you off the edge. Horizontal Kanoma is the exact opposite. Instead, putting the Pari shields on the left and the right, so the flanks. Watch out where the boss is facing, as again, if you attack them from the sides, you'll get knocked back, take damage, and get a Volan stack. Be careful while AoEing. I don't recommend AoEing if the Pari debuff is up, as you're more likely to accidentally grab uh, the shield and get knocked back and take the Voln up. The final skill it casts is again cast at 60% health, and it's Infusion. Infusion targets a random player with essentially a line stack with one little extra trick. If you're not stood directly in the middle of it, you will get knocked back to the side, so make sure that everybody's positioned on the pink-white that's taking this. If you want the player targeted to survive, the entire party needs to stack in front of them, tanks nearest to the ad, and you need to make sure you heavily shield and mitigate this, as it does a lot of damage, and if anybody takes full health, they get zombified. A way that a lot of groups will deal with this is instead just have that player hug the boss and make sure everyone else dodges this. 
This player will die, but in this phase you don't die, you get zombified, and as long as you don't need their DPS to finish off the first Demiurge in time, this isn't really a problem, as this debuff will fall off before you need them to actually do anything again. To break through how the entire ad phase works chronologically. First, immediately have your main tank grab the third Demiurge, while off tank takes aggro on the second and first. Make sure your main tank's facing the third away, just in case Gnostic Rant goes off sooner than you're expecting. Target the second Demiurge, and dodge the Gaze attack when it happens. Hopefully kill the second Demiurge shortly afterwards. Immediately start DPSing down the third, watch out for Ring of Pain. Pull the boss to that corner, watch out for when Gnostic Rant gets catch, cast. Be aware, there's a possibility that the tank will not have the opportunity to face him to the corner, so everyone should be watching for this cast to dodge to the rear of the ad whenever it goes off. Kill the third Demiurge, carefully maneuver around the ice puddle, watch out for any party buffs that might currently be on the first, so don't immediately start attacking it unless you're certain what sides are safe. Start to DPS it down, and when infusion happens, deal with it either by having the entire party stack with shields and mitigation, or having that one player get zombified. After you've killed all three of the adds in time, the boss is instead going to become completely untargetable, and everyone needs to go position over on the east side of the arena. If you've gone for the zombification method, go to the far side, as that player will chase after somebody randomly and try to attack them. They won't be in control, but it's perfectly fine. The boss is now going to start to prepare its ultimate attack. This starts by first tilting the entire stage off to the west side of the arena, and everybody's going to slide over there. You're now going to get another tilt. Right now is a good time to shield and mitigate. As immediately after the second tilt, the ultimate attack goes off. The scales of wisdom. It hits hard, mitigate, shield. The boss will become targetable and have your main tank immediately swivel the boss over towards one of the two sides so your melees can get their positionals. Now, I can't tell you for certain what your first attack here is going to be because it depends on how much DPS you did in the first phase. There is a point in the order of mechanics that the boss will skip to if you ever get the boss below 75%. I'm going to show you all of the mechanics, but be aware that at some point in time, the boss can skip if you ever force it below 75. The first mechanic is Quasar. This will have three tethers to one side, one tether to another, and everyone should stack due north for this, as it drops proximity AoEs underneath a bunch of random players. As soon as these drop, immediately sprint to the south side of the arena, Meteors will drop, but we don't need to worry about them because the stage will not tilt. This is instead teaching you the way that the red and the blue meteors work. One blue meteor perfectly balances three red meteors. This is the only time that Quasar will be balanced. From all future times, the stage is going to tilt to one side. So let's explain how to solve Quasar. When Quasar happens, there's two rules. First, go away from blue. As soon as you see the meteor lines appear, find the side that has blue, and go opposite it. The blue side is always going to be the heavier side, and the stage will always tilt towards it, so you need to be opposite it. The second rule is that for some of these slides, you need to be able to correctly predict if it's going to be a little tilt or a big tilt and position accordingly. Namely, should we stand on the three or the four way mark? The rule is this. If odd, go to odd. If even, go to even. Count the total number of tethers. If there is an odd number of total tethers, stand on the odd way mark. Even, stand on the even way mark. This will perfectly position you to slide all the way to the other edge, but not off the edge. In this case here, there are exactly three tethers, it's an odd number, so everybody stands on the three way mark. Now, back to the fight. The next mechanic is either going to be Thunder 3 or Arrow 3, either dodge in or out from the boss depending on which cast you see. We now get our first unbalanced Quasar. This will always be a 2-1. It's always going to be a slight tilt. All you need to do is make sure you go opposite the blue. Whichever side the blue appears on, get opposite it. Wait for the slide to go down, and you'll be fine. This is immediately followed by a Chintamani raid wide that'll hit two times. Shortly afterwards, you get a Tank Buster. Don't forget to swap, and watch out for that knockback. And then a Thunder 2. Now, I'm going to pause here for a second. This is where the fight skips to if you ever push the boss below 75%. It ignores all other previous mechanics and immediately skips to this to continue on the fight. Thunder 2, we dodge as just before. Don't be in front. 
Now we get another unbalanced Quasar. This will always be an even tether, so it's going to be a big slide. Go all the way to the edge to dodge this. Find the blue, go opposite it. So in this case, the entire party will go to two. And while waiting there, look for where the boss teleports to. They're about to dash across either the north or south of the arena, and we need to wiggle away from them. The whole group moves to the south. You don't have to go far, as that line AoE is going to go off just before the slide does. Next up, get into your partner positions, or find your partner and stand next to them, as we're going to get targeted with Sin and Punishment Circles. As long as it's one white with one black, you're good. This is followed immediately by a Chintamani Raidwide, so if anybody does fail this, they're very likely to die to the damage of the Chintamani. This will again only hit two times. There's another Tank Buster to mitigate and swap. And we get four clones appear. This will always be in the Thunder 3 combination, so with all four in the corners, diagonally facing inwards. One more raid wide to heal through, and this is the first time that Chintamani is going to hit from three times. Every future raid wide is going to hit three times. Get inside the boss's hitbox, as two adds are tethered with Thunder 3, remember those two, Northwest and Southeast. Then there's the Arrow 3, which will go on to the other two adds. Before we can go to any one safe spot, there's a tank buster to heal, mitigate, and swap through. And finally, the head is going to disappear and show up on a random side, cleaving one of your two donut safe spots. For this pattern here, northwest and southeast were the safe spots. Southeast is no longer safe, so the whole group runs towards the donut in the northwest. Afterwards, you get another Chintamani raid wide. Again, mitigates because this hits three times and another Tank Buster to mitigate and swap through. Now you get your first Quasar where you really need to count tethers. This could be a big or a small slide. You need to count tethers to figure out if you're going to an even or an odd waymark. Currently there are seven tethers, so everybody's going to go to the odd waymark. Go opposite blue, so this time everybody's going to go to the three waymark. The reason it's important we pick the correct waymark this time is before this attack goes off, the head teleports over towards the side you're going to and is going to blast anywhere except for the far edge of the arena. If you've not positioned correctly, you'll get hit by this to take heavy damage and potentially die. Afterwards, you've got enough time to be able to reposition the boss to middle, and you're going to get a Thunder 3, so get in. There's another Tank Buster. And we get our next Quasar. This is going to combine everything we've learned about Quasar so far. This time it's an even number, so we'll be going all the way to the edge. The party needs to go opposite blue, so they're going to go over to four. The head's going to teleport to a random look to the side to cleave, so you have to go all the way to the edge. And the boss will also teleport, so before you finish off, look if the boss is in the north or the south, and adjust to dodge it. There's another raid wide, another tank buster. A Thunder 2 cast a dodge. And then once again, get into your pairs. For this Sin and Punishment combo, while you're waiting for your colors to disappear, the head is going to teleport to a random side, and you need to once again position near it for the knockback. Don't move immediately. Wait for your Sin and Punishment to resolve, and then run towards the head. You might find this a nice place to use knockback immunity, so you don't need to immediately sprint over there. As you'll see here, I have a lot of the players just using knockback immunity to ignore this. There's another tank buster to swap. And just stay in your partner positions as there's another sin and punishment, this time combined with a quasar. This quasar will not have any other additional mechanics, no head or boss teleport, so just get all the way to the edge of the correct side for safety. Once again, wait for sin and punishment to resolve, then head opposite the blue. For this one, it happened to be an odd number, so it didn't matter if you were in or out, but you can't always just go to the edge for this one for safety. As you slide, four clones appear, this time in the Thunder 2 combination, so four of the six random spots. I recommend using this time to look for which corner doesn't have a clone, because this is a great place to use as your safe spot for the upcoming mechanic. There's a Raid Wad, and a Tank Buster to swap through, before the boss starts to activate these clones. First with Thunder 2, so dodge. And then with arrow three, so get out. 
before we go to the safe spot, which I, you could go behind that clone in the south, but I strongly recommend for this one, always go to an empty corner. It gives you a lot more room to resolve the final mechanic. You're going to get a quasar, so stack middle to bait all of your proximities, and then as soon as they appear, sprint towards the safe spot. In this case, the A corner. Assuming you've mitigated that well, that should be plenty fine and should give you a pretty decent uptime throughout the whole mechanic. While waiting here, start to get more or less into your clone, your partner positions, but your main tank needs to make sure they're very much in the hitbox as they're about to get targeted with a tank buster. This could be useful for them to knock back immune or just make sure you're definitely in so you don't get knocked off the edge of the arena. After this has been dealt with and the swap's taken place, be in your partner positions as you're going to get Sin and Punishment. Execute will be cast, and the Sin and Punishment only resolves when the Execute cast is about two-thirds full, which means you don't have much time to dodge afterwards. If you've done it in the safe corner where there's no clone, you don't have to do much movement. Three of the group should already be fine. It's just the group that's nearer to middle that wants to adjust further to the corner as soon as their Sin and Punishment resolves. Afterwards, you've got time to pull the boss middle, and you're going to see a lot of familiar things here. There's a raid wide, there's a tank buster, and there's a quasar, and this is now just repeated mechanics. This is the quasar with the head teleporting, so you have to pick the correct way mark, but it's nothing new. Just like before, count the number of tethers, go to either odd or even, go opposite blue, and get slid the right distance. Mechanics are now going to repeat until you get to about 11 and a quarter minutes, in which case the boss is going to cast Sin and Punishment, but this time it's either all sin or all punishment. As this comes with the Chintamani raid wide, there's nothing you can do here. Spreading out won't matter because the Chintamani always hits for lethal damage regardless of how you deal with this, so this will serve as the enrage for the fight. Kill the boss before sin and punishment resolves, or it's game over. If you've liked the improved visuals and animations in my more recent guides, then you might want to take a look at Skillshare. My earlier guides were not particularly known for their visual fidelity, and a large part of the reason behind that is because I was entirely self-taught at the time. I've since managed to pretty significantly improve the way my videos look, with classes on Skillshare helping to take me to the next level. Skillshare is an online community where you can explore lots of cool ways to develop your skills. Now is the perfect time to invest in yourself. With a Skillshare membership, you can engage in your hobbies and passions all year long, it's the perfect way to start and finally keep your resolutions for the new year. The Browse tool makes it really easy to find classes on topics you're interested in, like animation, film and video, and graphic design, all areas I wanted to explore. But you can also just search for exactly what you're most passionate about. I started out by searching Keynote Animation and found lots of great classes to help me develop my skills. My favorite so far is a class by Logan Nicholson on how to make animated videos with Keynote. The videos have shown me tons of new tricks I've been able to implement in my guides to make them look more visually interesting. The guide you're currently watching is actually the first time I've been able to get gameplay footage working within a guide, something I hope to use more often in future guides. I've loaded up a bunch of similar classes into my saved classes to check out for later, and Skillshare even does a great job recommending new classes to explore in the future. So make 2023 the year you perfect a new creative hobby, land a new career, or launch your business. Try out a risk-free 30-day trial to test it out yourself. Just follow the link below to begin your trial of Skillshare today.